Thank you for watching Planet of the Courageous. From a Tibetan point of view, we chose to be on this planet because we have enrolled in a sort of graduate school for courage. Just that we may have chosen this adventure is a leap of logic. The question is, how do we spend and make sense of this precious human life? We are, as a species, extraordinarily successful, dominating the planet and now with planetary-sized problems that our existence itself has created. It takes courage to face not only the uncertainty of our life, but the, also the challenge of sustaining the gift of life for future generations. My next guest, an erudite, hardworking, and good-hearted human being who has been hired by the Earth itself for a just approach. He is the lead counsel for Earth Justice, a national nonprofit that fights for causes to protect ourselves from some of our own short-sightedness. Their motto is, the Earth needs a good lawyer. And she has one in Paul Achitoff, a Harvard alumni and a grad from Columbia Law School. To save time for more sharing with him, I will highlight a few of his accomplishments. He has worked on issues from the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Hawaiian Water Code. He has been hired by migratory birds, endangered leatherback sea turtles, native streams and oceans, Hawaiian monk seal, and the air and land protesting genetic modified seeds and chemical dowsing. He is a true environmental warrior. Thank you for joining me, Paul. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Dean. It's always good to see you. It, it is nice to see you, Paul. It's it was something I was looking forward to. Um, Syn Syngenta, uh, 13.8 billion. Um, Monsanto, 15 billion. Uh, Dow Chemical. What, I can't, what I'm wondering is, was uh, the story of David and Goliath your favorite story as a child? <laughs> you seem to take on giants. Well, I don't know. I, um, I think I just uh, ended up taking on those companies and, and others like them because, well, uh, when you see something that you feel isn't the way, that, that doesn't seem just to you, you have an impulse to do something about it. And I don't think it really matters uh, the size of who's on the other side. Uh, the question is, is what you're doing, do you think that what you're doing is right? And so you do what you have to do. Uh, you've done some marvelous work. Uh, tell us about the national um, organization altogether. It has, um, I think, since 1965. It goes back quite a ways. Early and, 70s. Yeah, early, early 70s. 70s. Yeah. And then some of the national policies it's taking on now, if, if you know of any of the big suits, that, or do they vary by the locale? Well, they do. They vary quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, a, most of the work of the Hawaii office where I work is regional, not all of it, but most mm -hmm. of it has to do with Hawaii or the Western Pacific or the fisheries in the Pacific. And we have offices in uh, many locations around the country from Juneau to Tallahassee to New York, Los Angeles, Denver, mm -hmm. several others. And so, for example, we have lawyers that were representing uh, the, the tribes in Standing Rock. We have uh, lawyers who were or are uh, challenging uh, Trump's executive order uh, with regard to not being able to enact regulations unless you uh, revoke to others. Um, we have lawyers who are doing you know, everything from dealing with uh, toxic waste in one part of the country to uh, water pollution in another part of the country and, and so forth. So it's, it's an extensive group uh, extensive docket of cases with, you know, more than a hundred lawyers around the country. Let's do a little play imagination. If if the Earth had a voice, and it talked about justice, what do you think it would say to us? I think the Earth itself will do fine. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my own view. Others may disagree. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. think that the Earth uh, knows how to take care of itself. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the people and animals on the earth mm -hmm. that may have a more difficult time. And so, you know, if the earth were talking, I think the earth might say, I'm going to be here for a long time. I don't know about you. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if you want to be around longer, maybe you should think more carefully about who you vote for. <laughs> <laughs> or, or uh, I've been a good host, but I'm not sure you've been a good guest. <laughs> yep. 
Okay, some of that gets down to, at least when I look at the broad stroke of this thing, has to do with values, what we value. For instance, from the Hawaiian point of view, uh, I'm not going to do this well, but I'm, I want to say it in Hawaiian, umau e ka eaua ka aina i kapono, which is, of course, our state motto. And it's, it says that the, uh, the land and the life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. In the American Indian philosophy, they call the trees and the grasslands their cousins and their neighbors. And in the Tibetan point of view, the land is seen as profoundly interconnected and sacred. It seems like that message hasn't quite gotten through to some of the first world countries that were here as guests rather than as to dominate and use as we wish. What, what would cause a shift in values, do you think, that you could go back to a much more planet-centric view of things? That's a very interesting question, Dean. I, my own view is that uh, these distinctions between the Earth, the people, uh, me, you, etc., is essentially a creation of our own mind. Mm -hmm. And that in reality, there really are no such distinctions and that we are all uh, facets of a single entity, consciousness, whatever we want to call Juice, it. Juice, life Something. force. Something. Yeah. Right. And, and I think that through experience, we sometimes uh, are privileged to realize that, what, that whatever we do affects us. And I, and I think this is in part because ultimately whatever we do to somebody else, we are doing to ourselves yeah. in a sense. Yeah. Uh, there is no, it's impossible mm -hmm. uh, to, for me to do something to you without it affecting me. It just can't happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think Beautifully that, said, like that, the Indra's net thing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Just. And, and so I think people through experience realize that, hopefully, mm -hmm. that, uh, that they're not getting away with anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I, the name of my organization, Earth Justice, you know, it does suggest that, uh, you know, some, maybe there is justice in some places and not justice in others, but in, in my own view, things are just, and it's very hard to see it, uh, mm -hmm. that ultimately everything is the way it has to be, the way it is supposed to be. But that somehow doesn't, I think, preclude us from trying to do what we feel is right. And that may be difficult to think about, but that nevertheless is how I see things. You know, Paul, it reminds me of Suzuki Roshi's famous quote that uh, you're perfect the way you are and you could use a little help. <laughs> yeah, well, he certainly puts it better than I can. <laughs> or you can put it well. Uh, I want to get into some hot button topics, or this one's straight from my wife, so I hope you, it's about the EPA, and they just did a pretty decent article, pro and con, in the paper yesterday. But your own uh, organization sent out a pretty alarming flyer a couple of weeks ago about the uh, cuts that uh, the Trump administration is proposing, a 31% cut, the largest one to any organization. Mm -hmm. So it raises money in some disproportionate places, but just really pretty much guts the, not, that's, I'm sorry, that's, that's hyperboil. It, it, it cuts the, the EPA by a third. I want to know, like you just mentioned that you have lawyers who are stopping some of, some of the president's uh, capricious, you could say, uh, uh, signatures, you know, where he just has a good day or bad day and decides to sign something that's kind of, and our own Hawaiian uh, justice is saying, no way to uh, a huge piece of legislation in the Immigration Act. What I'm asking, I guess, is the EPA, what kind of force do you have, does your organization have, do the people's voice have to say, no way, Jose, we don't want to turn back time on environmental issues? Well, to the extent that the issue is the budget, uh, you know, individuals may not have uh, a direct path to uh, changing the budget, but the, the but the other than the same path we have with respect to every political decision, which is to uh, let our views be known through our legislators, through uh, protesting, through letter writing, etc. Uh, just as I think the our voices have been heard with respect to 
the travel ban with respect to uh, the health care uh, legislation. I mean, these things didn't just happen in a vacuum. They happened against a backdrop of outrage of people expressing themselves. And I think that with respect to the budget, that's the way it will work. That there's still a lot of negotiation to, and a lot of voices to be. Uh, oh, abso have. absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, legislators are, they want to be reelected. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, that is the bottom line. Why did the health care uh, bill that was designed to, to get rid of Obamacare, why did that fail? Well, because legislators want to be reelected. Yeah. That's why. Mm -hmm. And that's how you change budgets, that's how you change votes. Right. There's a, uh, something near and dear your heart. I asked you about uh, what was, uh, is there any good in GMOs and uh, genetic modified uh, organisms? And I think your quote was, uh, sometimes it makes money for the stockholders. Well, if we're talking, let, let me be clear if we're talking about genetically uh, engineered foods, yeah. which is what I have been dealing with, mm -hmm. you know, genetically engineered corn and soy and, and sugar mm -hmm. beets and those those things. My view is that, uh, well, there is, in a sense, a in the short term sense, there's a, a convenience for some farmers. Uh, in the longer term sense, in the environmental sense, and in a number of other environment, a number of environmental senses and economic senses, uh, I don't believe that they are that these products are uh, a good thing for anybody. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, does that mean that I'm necessarily against genetic engineering of any shape or form, regardless of the context? No. Actually, uh, yeah. if we were talking about a mm -hmm. medical use for mm -hmm. uh, a genetic engineering uh, technology, would mm -hmm. I sort of have a knee-jerk reaction that, no, it's genetically engineered, I don't, I don't want it? Yeah. No, yeah. not at all. Yeah. To me, it is a technology, it's a tool that is being used by certain corporations in the food context to make money and and I and that's why I believe that right. it serves that purpose for them but it doesn't serve a useful purpose for everybody else right I mean really kind of wisely and judiciously said I mean there is like um, I think his name is Ernest Borglund he's called the father of the green evolution he created a wheat resistant uh, drought resistant or pest resistant wheat in the 70s. It's said that he, his, his efforts alone, he also changed modern uh, farming practices in Mexico, Pakistan, and India. He said that he maybe went to the grave knowing that not only was he a Nobel Peace Prize winner, but that he saved a billion lives on the planet. There's sometimes things that are just so profoundly good for mankind on the GMO. Do you think, do you agree with that, or is it? Well, I would say that the, the, the so-called, you know, uh, green revolution in, 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 in farming is controversial, and, and I don't think that everyone would agree that it was a wonderful thing. Uh -huh. uh, I'm not saying that it, was, it wasn't good for some people in some places. I'm just saying that it, I don't think it was the unalloyed, you know, great thing that it's, it's sometimes, sometimes presented. Uh -huh. As far as genetic engineering is concerned, of course, the pitch from the companies is, you know, we're feeding the world, but I think that... You know, if you if you scratch any below the surface of that, you realize that's just hype. Uh, they it has nothing to do with feeding the world, and that is the problem with with hunger in the world is not that we don't have genetically engineered crops. It isn't even that we don't have enough food. It's that we have the food is not distributed to people. We can't get people. it to the places. We can't get we yeah. we could we don't yeah. get right. it to the people who need it because right. of corruption. Uh, primarily people putting in their pockets money that should be right. going to other places War. and so forth. And actual yeah. transportation, right. spoilage. Uh, yeah, so. personally I think that, that uh, small organic farms are on a, on a global level are a great deal more important to feeding the world than, than genetically engineered soybeans. Interesting. Just, I mean, great perspective. Appreciate it. We're going to break now. We'll come right back. I've got the Beagle Sisters here with a healthy tip. We encourage you to enjoy the food you eat this holiday season and keep it local and healthy. Yeah. Eat the rainbow. Eat yeah. the rainbow. And if you need any produce, come to the Red Barn on the North Shore. 
Aloha, my name is Justine Espiritu, and I am the co-host of Hawaii Farmers Series. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson, and we are live with you every Thursday at 4 p.m. at thinktechhawaii.com. And our show focuses on Hawaii's local food uh, community. We feature not only the farmers that are producing our food, but we also feature the supporters and other folks involved in the community that are trying to promote local agriculture. <laughs> Okay, Paul, this one's uh, for Walt Ordway, a farmer in Iowa, a, a man that I went to uh, college uh, with. And uh, after a wonderful life, he retired to his, uh, his homestead. It's a quite large farm that, uh, down in Soldier, Iowa, which is in southwestern Iowa. It really is the corn basket of, of America. The farms down there are sometimes 5,000 acres, so big one. And his mission, his last year, is when Walt took on a mission. It was not a pretty thing always to be around. <laughs> so he was uh, actually uh, interviewed in a Wall Street Journal. There were movies made about him. But I, I promised him, on some level, I would ask this question. It's about seed ownership and genetic coding. He protected a 100-acre uh, plot with, his, with other lands to try to uh, bring it up to the standard of uh, organic farming, which isn't easy when everybody around you is using chemicals. But his real bandwagon was to wake people up to the fact that a few corporations were owning seeds, actually owning the title to seeds. And this is not me saying it. It's Monsanto was actually forcing the, the uh, farmers to never reuse the seeds, they owned the seeds, they were given the seeds and they had to buy them every year. It was just like this stunning thing that farmers couldn't produce their own seeds. Right. So I'd, I wonder if you would kind of weigh in and jump into this one a little bit. Well, I, I think, sake. I, I, I agree that the, uh, much of what is behind the genetic engineering seed industry, genetically engineered seed industry, is about seed ownership as much as anything else mm -hmm. because these seeds are patented mm -hmm. uh, you know up until a few decades ago you couldn't patent life in this way but uh, the, now you can um, and these companies have taken advantage of that uh, and so as you say uh, a farmer farmers for millennia have relied upon uh, saving their own seed and replanting it the next year and making hybrids and doing what they want with their own seed. And with genetically engineered seed, you don't own this, you never actually own the seed. You buy, you buy seed subject to a license agreement that you have to sign with uh, Monsanto or, or Syngenta or one of these, co these companies which prohibits you from replanting the seed and in fact, if you do, or they imagine that they that you do, they they may sue you, and they have done that many times. Mm. Uh, and so the whole idea is is one of ownership. Uh, essentially, you have a vast amount of the uh, commodity seeds in in mm. this country, and increasingly elsewhere, being owned by a handful of large corporations. But essentially, they are trying to, and succeeding to some extent own the food supply because the crops that they own the seeds are are the, the ones that go into so much of what we eat corn soy canola sugar beets for sugar alfalfa uh, you know these are are the crops that people eat every day whether they realize it or not and somebody owns that uh, it's just wild yeah. and then our own genetic code our own genomes now I, I've studied a little bit there's been suits and counter suits like my genetic code, for instance, since it's naturally occurring, can't be uh, patented. But if they modify it in some ways, now it's not naturally occurring, then they can patent it. And there's been suits and countersuits. I mean, this has been going on. I mean, I have to tell you, but I, when Walt brought this to my attention, I thought he was he was prone to maybe smoking things that weren't were <laughs> But he wasn't in, this is not hyperboil. And what was it, Quaid's movie, Dennis Quaid did it. Any price that movie were in set in in his 
town or in, mm. in yeah, Iowa. I didn't see that one. It had to do with just what you're talking about. And he was a seed salesman. And there was a underground revolution going on within the within the farmers. So this whole thing about genetic code is just fascinating that it can be old. It really is. It really is. Uh, and I think that, that control is, is, is a key element to the whole genetic engineering industry where people are locked into not only buying the same the seed mm -hmm. year after year, but buying the pesticides that are specifically designed to go with oh. those specific, those round particular with, seeds. Round up right, with Roundup with Roundup resistant seed right. and so forth. Uh, it, it's a kind of, these those products were specifically mm -hmm. designed to work together and of course Monsanto Roundup is, is a huge money maker for Monsanto, so they designed seed that was immune to Roundup, so they would sell you the seed and then they would say, oh, and here's the Roundup that you get to spray on it without killing it. Something to fire so they make money, this, right? They make money coming and going. Coming and going. Right, and then they tell you, and it's, it's, it's easier for you. What, what happens, what we found, is that if you spray Roundup or, or the same herbicide uh -huh. of any sort over and over again on your field, there are going to be some weeds in that field that, that will survive. Yeah. They will survive be naturally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, the next year, those few weeds will uh -huh. now be a lot more because they don't have any competition and the Roundup isn't going to kill Here them. Here we go. And then you Natural end up selection. with a, a field full uh -huh. of Roundup resistant weeds. And this has happened actually on tens of millions of acres of farmland in this country. So now we have a new generation of genetically engineered mm -hmm. seed that's designed to be immune to not only Roundup, but 2,4-D, which is uh, a component of the Vietnam era defoliant agent orange, which is designed specifically in this uh, formula to uh, kill the weeds that Roundup no longer is able to kill as a result of the use of Roundup resistant seeds. Right, right, right. So it's this, it's this cycle this, the, of, mm. of you know, pestis, more and more pesticides. Yeah. This is obviously very disturbing, I mean, to actually figure out who that ownership could be in the hands of a few giant companies that are food sources themselves. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to kind of switch again to something. There, what, what I'm wondering is, it seems like uh, what I want to get to is cooperation or other people helping Earth justice. And but what I'm thinking is, like, one of the things you talked about, artisan, this is uh, on our... Uh, uh, right up in the elevator. This chemical that's been used widespread in agriculture, particularly in the Midwest, I think you right. said, and there's a, it's now polluted many streams, rivers, groundwater, et cetera. Right. Do you see cooperation coming from, so I, there I'm going, okay, wetlands. Is Ducks Unlimited calling Earth Justice and say, we've got to put a, can we join you? Can we put some money behind you? Are we seeing cooperation in the green movement? Well, I, I can't speak about what Ducks Unlimited is doing. I don't know. No, it's um, just, but, it was just an example. But in terms, I'm just saying, I, yeah. I, the, the, uh, I mean, certainly there are people that donate, some of them substantially, to operations like Earth Justice and mm -hmm. others that are mm -hmm. doing work to control these issues. So, mm -hmm. yeah, people are stepping up, and, uh, you know, that's the only way that we can do what we do. Yeah. I think another place my mind went on this is that I, I'm a Norwegian bachelor farmer from Lake Wobegon and, and part of our training was at, at that point that we were to be stewards of our earth. It, it meant that in the Hawaiian terms the earth was our kuleana. We couldn't walk away from any part of it. I'm just wondering if you're seeing the green Christian movement come and say hey we've got to we've got to become better stewards. We're looking at extinction rates that are just profound at this point. 50% of our primate ancestors that took uh, on the level of 500 million years maybe to go, will be extinct by the end of the century. Mm -hmm. Amphibians, the frogs, the distortion and, and mm -hmm. uh, reproduction, I mean this is happening you know, now. Yeah. I'm well, just wondering what our stewards, where are our stewards showing up, particularly that green Christian movement? You know, I, I personally have not represented uh, green Christian groups in my work, but mm -hmm. I believe that other earth justice attorneys have in uh, their work. And I, I do uh, notice with, with interest uh, that the Pope has been outspoken on some of these issues in Isn't a way that, that just, wow. uh, I have not experienced in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he, he understands some of these issues better than I imagined uh, 
you know, a pope ever would, just yeah. because based on my previous experience. But I think he said some remarkable things. Isn't that just a ground changing? No. Oh. This man speaking up and saying, let's look at this in a sensical way. This is a small globe, a small planet. Yeah. Um, a precious spaceship, as right. uh, Buckminster Fuller which, said. Which I think it's very encouraging that someone who is uh, as deeply religious as he obviously is sees no uh, incongruity between that, be uh, between his faith and, and stewardship, stewardship of the earth. Stewardship of the earth. We have a few minutes left, so let's take on a small... So, oh, no, I want to hand this one off to you a little bit, because you're doing some sensational... This work that you're doing, you actually uh, have a class action suit against the EPA for discrimination for the disproportionate amount of chemicals being shuffled to our indigenous peoples. I, I know I'm not doing a good job, but All I'm right, trying to me, tee you up for yeah, that Yeah, let me... Let me Straighten that out. Uh, actually, <laughs> I'm not suing the EPA. Oh. Actually, I, I, I filed a formal complaint with the EPA and asked them to open an investigation, which mm -hmm. they subsequently did, into what I consider to be violations of the civil rights laws, uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of, of 1964, which uh, against the, our State Department of Agriculture and our State uh, Agribusiness Development Corporation because of the things that they are doing and are failing to do in protecting, or, or in the case of what they are doing, exposing uh, Native Hawaiians to pesticides in a, in a way that is not, you know, that I'm not being exposed to, you're not being exposed to, they're being exposed to it on West Kauai, uh, on Molokai, in areas that are, are uh, have many Native Hawaiians are cheek by jowl with these extensive uh, fields uh, that are being intensively sprayed with very, very powerful pesticides that drift into those schools, into those homes, into those yards. And uh, the, the state has been doing squat about it. And so that's why I've turned to the EPA and they have opened an investigation. That's just wild because it could open up all kinds of, uh, not just losses, but just acknowledgments that uh, poor people suffer uh, an imbalanced proportion on these things. The chemicals come down to Flint, Michigan, or whatever. Yeah, there's no question in my mind that yeah. if, the, if someone were spraying a, a, a powerful pesticide next door to Punahou and kids were you know, coughing and taken to the hospital, uh, that that wouldn't happen again. And yet that ha has happened repeatedly uh, uh, at Waimea Middle School on Kauai wow. because those kids wow. don't go to Punahou. Wow. Paul, we're out of time. I want to I wanna again thank you. It's really always a pleasure to be with you in whatever the circumstances. And uh, I think my sign off has always been the same. You know, be kind, be courageous, do some good and mostly just have some fun on the planet. Aloha.